If you'd put my slide up there, Richard, on the back wall too, please, so I can see it. And go to slide number four. <coughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. Okay. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit. Everybody say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. And um, remember, uh, just to remind you, he is not a bird. Okay. He is, he's got, he's, he, uh, the bird, is, the dove descended like you know, he ascended like a bird. The Holy Spirit descended like that. And it represent those nine, those nine feathers on each side of those wings represent the nine gifts of the Spirit and the nine fruit of the Spirit. Sometimes we get focused on the gifts and sometimes we get focused on the, on the fruit. And I'm telling you, it takes both for us to do what we need to do in the body of Christ. All right. So today, is the, the message is called Jesus' Teaching in the Upper Room. Say Upper Room. All right, so take your mind back to that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, John 14, 18. I'm going to read out the King James and also the New King James, okay? It should be up there for you. And here's what he says. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Everybody say will. will. Then John 14, the New King James said, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you, okay? Now, let me tell you, most of you know my story. I was raised in a church. Uh, where I was not taught biblical principles as I know them today, okay? We went to church. They just didn't know, okay? And in that church, I encountered Jesus in April the 7th, 1973, and transformed my life like crazy. You know, I was president of the uh, MYF, the youth group, and all this, and we had fun, and we played spin the bottle and all kinds of way cool stuff. But nobody ever told us that I needed to have a relationship with Jesus. We just did it because that's my mom and dad went. We went. That's what we did. Okay. But um, when that happened, I got born again. And then I became hungry for more. Anybody ever been hungry for more? Okay. Said, I know there's something there that, that's even better than this. And, not, and I was so excited because so many things happened. A lot of my friends got born again. We were having 150 kids show up on Tuesday nights at a Bible study at somebody's house. And they were all getting born again because we were passionate about Jesus and, and our lives being changed. But I knew that there was more. And then I found out a church that my brother was going to because my brother started being weird. Okay. He was happy all the time. I didn't think that was normal. He says, you need, to, you need to come hear this. I said, what, man? He goes, well, they're teaching about this thing called the Holy Spirit, their spirit-filled church. I said, what does that mean? He goes, well, that means they're full of it. I said, I believe they're full of it. <laughs> he goes, no, no, they're full of his life, full of his love, full of his spirit, full of his mercy, full of his grace, man. They're just, it's just, it's just alive. You got to come. So I did. And then I embraced the person of the Holy Spirit one night. That our, we had a band at the time that traveled all over the place. And, and um, we used to have a Bible study on Saturday night. And it would sometime go three or four hours. And, and um, somebody asked me, he said, do you want to get filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? I said, yep. So they did. I didn't speak in tongues at the time. I waited till on the way home because I didn't want to be weird like my brother. And so in that, on my way home, I looked around in my car at 2.30 in the morning and, and I said, okay, I'm making sure nobody's going to hear this because I got this word inside of me that's got to come out that's not English. So I did. And there's another word that came out, then another word. That was about it. There's two or three words. And I said, yeah. then there was this joy and it felt like this, um, you know, like you turned on a faucet, you know, it went from a trickle to whoosh. I couldn't get enough of him. Okay. And the big mirror, the Bible says that, that the devil immediately comes to steal the word that's been sown in our hearts. No matter what it is today, you may get a revelation of something or maybe just something that you've heard over and over and over again. All of a sudden, God will shed a little bit more light on it. And all of a sudden you'll go, what? I didn't see that before. Yeah, that's happened to my daughters, you know, as they've been raised in the word of God from the time they're little. Here they are now when they're 20. Dad, did you see this? I said, 
Yeah, I taught you that when you were five years old. She was saying, no, no, Dad, you don't understand. I said, I see it. I see it. No, no, you really don't understand it. And I said, so you just rejoice with them anyways. Praise Jesus. I'm glad. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's a great revelation. I'm so excited for you. That's way cool. It's way cool. So, you know, hearing those fresh teachings that are mixed with the Holy Spirit begin to change me. Okay. I want to talk to you about those teachings on the Holy Spirit. So let's go to the upper room where Jesus was gathered with his disciples, and this was on the very eve of his crucifixion, okay? This is where he took time to teach him about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, okay? Um, they're going to be the basis for what we're going to talk about. And um, this was his last opportunity to teach his disciples on the earth, okay? There's all kinds of things that Jesus could have taught them, but he told, he wanted to talk to them of the Holy Spirit. He knew that in his absence, when he was gone, they were going to need a very powerful, ongoing relationship with the Holy Spirit. Say relationship. 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 Okay? So, therefore, Jesus devoted his entire opportunity night on that night for that ministry, okay? And we can always find that in John, you know, chapter 14, 15, and 16, all those chapters or relate to that. And I don't know how long it took, but it did take some time. You know, it takes some time just to read that part. So that evening, you know, he talked about it. Um, and he's trying to let them know that when you're tempted to despair, or when you're waiting and waiting and waiting, you know, that um, you're going to need a little bit something extra when you get some heavy news. I want to read, first of all, in John chapter 13, okay? And... Um, if you want to turn there, you can. Um, I'm going to read this. It won't be up on your screen. Um, now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And after supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing, everybody say knowing, that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God. Jesus rose from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Yuck. Those were some nasty feet. And he, to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? And Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Okay. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, then you have no part with me. Ouch. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. If you're going to do my feet, man, just give it me all of it. That sounds just like Simon Peter. And Jesus said to him, he who is be bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Say that. I need to be washing somebody else's feet. Don't get nervous when you're washing your feet this morning, okay? It's, it's all right, all right, okay? For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verse 16, most assuredly I say to you, a servant, everybody say servant, is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. He said, I do not speak concerning all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He who eats bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. 
Now I tell you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe that I am he. And most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. Okay. In verse 17, okay, in that Bible, there's a, a word in there. And I want to talk to you about what it means to be a secure leader in any endeavor that you do. Everybody in here is a leader at some point in some place, somehow, in your life right now. So look at somebody say, you're a leader. Okay, so he's talking about all of us, okay? Okay, these are secure leader traits. As Jesus took the towel and basin to wash his disciples' feet, his assuming, assuming a servant's role exhibits more than humility, but also evidences the psychological security essential to a leader okay not only was it humble and not only was it an act of humility but it was also knowing who and whose you are next slide there if you would please jesus lifestyle and lessons established mode for a new kind of leader the servant leader okay servant leaders next slide please this out of matthew 20 starting verse 26 Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Next slide, 27. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So back there in John 13, 31 through 38, it said, when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of God the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him immediately. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment. Everybody say commandments. Amen. I give to you that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. If, everybody say, if you have love for one another. Okay. Gone down in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered him, said, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Peter said to him, Lord... Why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, Will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Okay? The disciples at that time had this feeling, and they could be feeling that they were getting ready to be abandoned. Abandoned. He said, remember John 14, verse 18, he said, I am not going to leave you comfortless. Okay, next slide there, please, Richard. That word, um, go on down there to verse thir uh, 113, slide 13. <clears throat> that word comfortless, it's a translation of the Greek word orphanos, and this is where we get the Greek word orphan. Okay, when you do that, a little, uh, a, like a, an expression would be, he said, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. But it also had a wider meaning at the time. It also means like uh, the fact of that a teacher uh, or that is abandoning his students. And they were students, and so they had this wider meaning that he was totally abandoning them because he said that he was going away. Okay, so that's a tough, tough thing that they were having to do because Jesus was leaving the earth. They couldn't quite comprehend this whole thing. He was not going to abandon them, okay? He would come to them through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. If I say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. And exactly, is, he is the one who is going to represent Jesus in every way, okay? Jesus was letting them know, okay, that he sent in a personal replacement for him, okay? One who would be with each and every one of those disciples and anybody that followed him afterward 
for eternity, okay? He later told us that it is far better that I go and I send you this comforter, the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, next slide there, please. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Here's Jesus telling these guys to say, Now listen, fellas. It's to your advantage that I go away. They can't comprehend that. They walked with this guy. They've done everything. They've seen all kinds of miracles and stuff. And he says, but because they just don't know. He said, it's to your advantage that I go away. Okay. He goes, for if I do not go away, then the helper won't come. Okay. But if I depart, he goes, I am going to send him to you. So through the work of the Holy Spirit, then uh, Christ Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing could reside with every believer in every place on the earth simultaneously. Okay, because of what Jesus did, Jesus could only be, be so far, but the Spirit is everywhere. So every believer worldwide, now, if you're born again, the residence of the Holy Spirit. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you a comforter. And he goes, man, it's going to be good that I go away. Once Jesus, <laughs> when he was exalted to the right hand of the Father, he became the role of our intercessor for eternity. Okay? Eternity. It's good that he goes away. Next slide. 15. Hebrews 7.25. He says, therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through, through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Okay? He poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit once he was seated. In Acts, next slide, Acts 2.33. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the, from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. Today, the Holy Spirit is the member of the Godhead who operates in this world right now. Remember, God's on the throne. Jesus is at his right hand. The Holy Spirit is now, and he lives in us. Look at somebody say, man, he's in you. Let him know, okay? Who? Jesus is Lord over the church, and the Holy Spirit is the one that carries out the lordship over the church, okay? Next slide, Ephesians 1, 13 through 14. In him, he said, you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Next slide. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Okay, so he's telling us that once we get born again, the Holy Spirit comes inside of us and takes up residency on the inside of us, okay? Once we have surrendered, everybody say surrendered, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, okay? Once that has happened, okay, then the Holy Spirit comes and resides in us. That word surrendered, there are areas in our lives, I'm talking to myself as well, I'm going to say we and us, that we have not completely surrendered to him. Do you agree with that? There might be some of you, you know, maybe not Brother Moore because he's been around a long time. And, you know, I think this guy, it's God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, then Brother Moore. You know, that's, that's, just, that's, just the where, that's just what I believe and know about him. You know, I've known him a long time. He has spoken into my life, you know, so... I trust explicitly anything he says, he'll send me a note every once in a while. I said, you need to check this out. And sure enough, I need to check that out, you know. So there are areas, okay? The Holy Spirit is resident in us. He's resident in me. Okay? That's, and in fact, we're going to read here in Romans 8 in the next slide. <laughs> But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Okay? 
We can't personally know the Lord Jesus unless the Holy Spirit's living in us. So if you want to be of that uh, genre that uh, the Holy Spirit is not a real thing, I am telling you, you can't even be born again unless he lives on the inside of you because that's what the Word of God bears out, okay? That is the way that we give our life to him is that we are surrendered to his lordship. And the Holy Spirit has sealed us and he has permanently moved into our hearts at that time. He, the Holy Spirit is not just a hotel, okay? He just doesn't come stay at the leaves, comes and stay in leaves. He is there permanently, okay? And if I ask everybody in here, I said, how many of you are born again? Yeah. You know, I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Okay, next slide. Our heart is his home. Okay, do you believe that statement? Yes. That our heart is his home, where the Holy Spirit lives, okay? Now, if that's true, I'm going to make another statement. That does not always reveal the fact that we have fellowship with him. We can be born again and still not walking in fellowship because we haven't surrendered certain things or certain areas of our life to him. Does that make sense? How many of you ever battled depression? Okay, it, it happens, it comes, it comes, it comes. Now, in him, if he's living on the inside of us, you know, if we don't surrender and yield ourselves to that part of the word that talks about that, that depression can't stay, then I'm telling you, we're living beneath our privilege as born again men and women. Okay? If Eric hasn't surrendered his whole life to the area of food, which is obviously that I haven't, some things are more obvious on the outside than some of the things that are on the inside. So when you see your pastor and you know that he struggles with those things, then what do you say? Oh, what's his problem? Why don't you just fix it and be on with it? No, because if we love one another and if we're part of the family, then I want you to succeed. I want you to succeed in every area. I want you to succeed. So that's why we should pray one for another. Would you believe that? Okay, so that's okay. All right. All right, so this act of surrendering, okay, we need to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to ask you this question. What kind of fellowship do you have with the Holy Spirit at this time in your life? What kind of fellowship is going on with you and Him? As you take this word, and as we begin to read it and study it, Amen. And you know, I'd be hanging out in Galatians, Ephesians, John 14, 57. Oh, there's tons of stuff in here, you know. All of that to discover who we are and whose we are in Christ Jesus. That fellowship in the word and in worship. He said we should worship in, in what? In spirit and in truth. Okay. He said, thy word is truth. Is that correct? Okay. So in that... You know, we love to go into his presence and, and hang out there, but sometimes we forget to be diligent with this part of it. You know, well, I, you know, for me, man, I can come up here and sit at the piano, just hang out with the Lord, but, you know, I also know that I have to bring this word, and if I combine that and I can sit and I can sing the word and worship the word at the same time, there's something more deeper that's going on. And that's not even good English, but it makes sense to me. More deeper is not good English, right, Miss Alice? It's okay. <laughs> I can say it. It's more deeper. It's more deeper. Going to say it again. It's more deeper. To me, if I can worship him in spirit and in truth, then there comes more of this thing, you know, that begins to manifest where the dunamis power will hit you and your brother will come and lay hands on you. And then all of a sudden you get, what happened to you, Gary? You got burnt, right? And then next thing you know, you're in church with all kinds of bandages. Then you only got one. All because he decided during worship time, he goes, man, I ain't got no pain. Hey, 
And he's dancing around. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? Ain't nobody laid hands on him. Ain't nobody did nothing. But because of our worship and our praise, and because y'all have been in the Word so much, then it starts to manifest. And that river that you released in the house, it begins to flow and it begins to move. And next thing you know, whoa, that's happening, that's happening. And then when we take that out of here and our fellowship with Him, then we become, we become couriers and carriers of His presence and His dunamis power that no matter what, no matter what kind of day you've had in the animal clinic, that you can still smile no matter what you're breaking loose in it. And no matter what you touch, that flow is still going out of you into other things, into the atmosphere, and it changes it. Because we're way makers. Okay, miracle workers. 